Chapter 13. Don't Call Me Baby. Miss Lena shoved the bagged lunches into the Underbird's back seat, tossed her fan beside them, and opened the driver door. You're really driving? I said, backing away from the car. Couldn't we call Miss Rose or, or hire a driver? Bad news is best delivered in person, and I have no driver at the moment, she said, sliding behind the wheel. Everybody's either working or at Jessie's. Besides, I've already called Rose once this morning to update her on Mr. Mason's condition. That bulletin sent her to the garden for the rest of the day. Dale will be in shackles before I can reach her again by phone, she said, squinting at the dashboard. That garden has saved Rose a fortune in therapy over the years, she muttered. It's cranked out some good tomatoes, too. But you still can't mow. Please get in the car. She tugged the rear mirror down and applied a fresh coat of lipstick. We'll drop the lunches off on our way. I slid in. Miss Lena? Yes, sugar. I think maybe I better drive. She glared at me, her wig glistening gold in the sun. How old are you? Eleven. And why should you drive? I looked away. Because, Miss Lena, you don't know how. She graced me with a stony silence, the chill rolling off of her in the noonday heat. Everybody in town knows you can't drive. It's common knowledge. There's nothing common about knowledge. The fact that I haven't driven doesn't mean I can't. Now, she said, tilting her head. This vehicle is new to me. Where is the ignition? I slumped in my seat, fastening my seatbelt and prepared to die. Right there, I muttered, pointing. I closed my eyes as she turned the key. I'm ready to back up now, if common knowledge will allow, she said, studying the gear shift. I sighed. The underbird is an automatic. Just put the pointer on the R. R she said, placing her foot on the accelerating er, accelerator and pressing it toward the floor. It means reverse, I shouted over the roaring engine. You don't give it gas until after. She yanked the gear shift to R. The underbird lunged backward and we skidded across the parking lot in a spray of gray gravel and dust. Only our collision with the sycamore kept us from careening around the building down into the backyard. See, she said, taking her foot from the from the gas. D means drive. This time shift before you give it gas. That way spinning wheels and flying gravel chewed up at the end of my sentence, spitting it across the parking lot like a fighter spitting teeth and we were on our way. To my relief, Miss Lena had the underbird somewhat under control by the time we swerved into Mr. Jesse's drive. I thought so anyway until she took dead aim at the thr at a throng of our neighbors. Use the brake, I cried, diving into the foot of the car and slamming both hands onto the brake. Lunch, dears, she called as a pine branch swept across our windshield. Mo, get up. People will think you're daft. Yes, ma'am, I muttered, wiping the grit from my hands. Ten minutes later, we headed for Miss Rose's. Dale's house is around this curve, I said. I mentioned that because you might want to slow down by using the brake, <laughs> I added. She hunched over the wheel. Rose is already depressed, so we'll present our news gently, she said, easing up on the gas. Be positive. Follow my lead. She gave the steering wheel a tug to the left. The tire screamed as we skidded across the asphalt, bouncing off the drive and crunched across Miss Rose's petunia bed. As we lurched to a halt with our front left tire on the porch step, Miss Rose dropped her hoe and sprinted towards us. P for park, I instructed. As the underbird issued an ominous hiss, I opened my door and stepped out. Remember, be positive, Miss Lena said. Hey, Miss Rose, I'm sorry Mr. Mason took drunk again, but at least there ain't nobody in jail yet. That's a positive. Mama, Dale cried, pounding around the corner of the house. I heard tires. Is Lavender here? Oh, he said, spotting me and Miss Lana. He stared at the pine branch trapped beneath the underbird's windshield wiper and his mouth fell open. 
Hello, dear friend, Miss Lena said, opening her door as far as the front porch would allow. She slithered out sideways, wiggling her butt along the porch until she reached the back of the car. Gosh, I didn't know you could drive, Dale said. She can't, Miss Rose said, her voice flat as her petunias. Like Dale, Miss Rose has a firm grasp of the obvious. Rose, if you don't mind, we need to talk. You don't have any tea, do you? I'm parched. A half a glass of iced tea later, the four of us roared back toward Mr. Jesse's place with Miss Rose at the wheel. Dale and me huddled in the back seat. I could feel him trembling. I pressed my shoulder against his, trying to will my calm into his body. I just know I'm going to jail, he whispered. No, you ain't. You're a juvenile. Besides, even if you do, it won't be so bad. You could bond with the, with the incarcerated side of your family, and I'll bring you your homework assignment so you don't fall behind in school. Great, he muttered. Jail time and math. My life can't get no worse than this. He was wrong. Dale's life got a lot worse just about the time Detective Starr started asking questions. So, you admit to stealing the boat? Starr asked, taking his notepad from his pocket and sitting on Mr. Jesse's port trail. I tugged my clue pad out of my pocket and settled in the port swing beside Dale. Dale didn't steal nothing. Stealing is such a harsh concept, Miss Lana agreed, popping her fan up. Dale didn't say he stole Jesse's boat. He said he returned it. That's right, I said. Dale, I'm talking to you, son. Ah. Uh, I guess it might look like I stole it, but I didn't. I just borrowed it good and strong. Me and a friend wanted to go fishing's all. Fishing ain't no crime, I added quickly. Depends on what kind of license you got, Star said, and the blood drained from Dale's face. It's just like Dale to worry about getting caught without a fishing license after he admitted to stealing a boat. Who were you going fishing with? Me, I said, saving Dale having to wrap me up. Dale, I'm talking to you. I was going to take it back, he looked at Miss Rose. I did take it back, he pleaded. Miss Rose nodded. She sat in Mr. Jesse's rickety old rocking chair, her hands folded calmly as prayer in her lap. To me, she looked worried. When did you return it? Right after my brother invited me and mowed to time lapse at the Carolina Raceway. Yesterday, some day, same day we saw you at the Speedway with Miss Retzel. Such a good boy, Miss Lena said, beaming. You took that boat back out of the goodness of your heart, didn't you, Dale? No, ma'am. I took it back because we needed the reward money for fried bologna sandwiches. I winced. Dale's not cut out for the life of crime. Tell me about the boat. Well, Mr. Jesse hardly ever used it, and I only hid it a ways down from his place. He could have found it if he really wanted to. Star looked at Dale, his eyes hard. Tell me about taking it back. Dale shoved his hand in his pocket. It made him look smaller somehow. Well, I walked the boat up the creek, and then I went over to Mr. Jesse's house and knocked on his door. And Mr. Jesse, he come to the door, and he said, Afternoon, Dale, how's your mother? And I said, She's fine, Mr. Jesse. I sure hope you, you are. I got exciting news for you. I found your boat. I hope it wasn't a hardship not having it. And he said, not at all. Thank you, son. Here's your reward money. And I left. Star looked up from his notes. No kidding, he said. That was real cordial. Sure, Mr. Jesse was a real cordial man. Star scratched his eyebrow. Well, I guess I'm a little, a little surprised from what folks have told me. I didn't think Jesse Tatum was a particularly cordial kind of guy. Did you find him cordial, Miss Rose? Of course not. Dale Earnhardt Johnson III, you stop this foolishness, she said, cracking her words. Like, well, you tell Detective Star the truth and you tell it now. Yes, ma'am, Dale said. His chin quivered and he looked at Star. Maybe just you and me could talk man to man. Dale, whatever it is, just say it, Miss Rose said, her voice going gentler now. He looked across the yard, fixed on Star's car. He, he looked across the yard, fixing on Star's car like he could stare the shine right off of it. All right. I walked the boat up the creek to Mr. Jesse's dock, and I knocked on the door like I said. Mr. Jesse came to come to the door in his pants and his undershirt, and he unlatched the door, and he pushed it open, and... 
He said, what are you doing on my doorstep, you no good son of a white trash drunk? Miss Rose gasped, but Miss Lana nodded. That's the Jesse I knew, she said. Dale's voice was low. Then Mr. Jesse said, you get your scrawny good-for-nothing self off my land before I call the law, and you tell your daddy if I see him on my land again, I'll call the law on him too. No warning given. Well, then I said, I'll be glad to get off your filthy scrap of swamp soon as you pay the reward you owe me for getting your boat bag, you ugly old waste of human skin. And if you've got a message for my dad, you could deliver it yourself if you ain't scared. Well, then he said, you think I'm shelling out 10 bucks on the word of Mason Johnson's leftovers? You show me my boat if you've got it. So we walked down to the creek and he saw his boat and he gave me $10 and no thank you and I skedaddled. Star nodded. Which way did you go? Through the woods. Who was with you? Nobody. I raised my hand. Even if somebody was with him, which there wasn't, it wasn't me. I could tell you an alibi if you needed. If needed. Star didn't take his eyes off the deal. Don't lie to me, son. There were two sets of footprints where you hid the boat, and there were two sets of on the creek bed by the dock. Yours and an adult's. Two sets of footprints? I'll ask you again. Who was with you? Nobody, Dale said, looking scared. I, I got the boat and walked, up, walked it up the creek. I tied it right about where I found it. Where it was when you stole it? I object. We've already established this wasn't a technical steal. This was more like a surprise borrowing between neighbors. Don't say nothing, Dale, I warned. Star turned Miss Rose. Doesn't sound like Mr. Jesse thought much of your husband. She looks suddenly tired. Nobody thinks much of my husband. Can't say that I blame them. Where was he last night? He came home around eight. He left maybe three hours later. I'm not sure where he came from or where he went. Had he been drinking? He's always been drinking. You leave mama out of this, Dale said. Star ignored him. What size shoe does your husband wear? Nine, nine and a half. Well, here's the situation. I've got Dale's footprints and an, and an adult's footprints at the scene of the crime. Dale admits stealing Jesse Tatum's boat. Your husband was drinking and his whereabouts at the time of the murder are unknown. So I need you to fill in some blanks for me unless you really do want to call a lawyer. Now Miss Rose looks scared. I don't know that I can fill in many blanks, but I can tell you Dale is no murderer. She gave Dale a look that would break stone. A thief, maybe, but not a murderer. I promise, Dale said, his eyes filled with tears. I didn't steal nothing, and I don't know whose footprints got tangled up with mine. I thought back to Dale returning the boat, and then further back to the day he took it. I know, I said quietly. I studied my notes until everybody was looking. There's no need to wait for dramatic pause. That's what Miss Lana says. Those prints you found were from lavender shoes. Lavenders? Miss Rose cried, grabbing Miss Lana's arm for support. Dale blinked, and then he smacked himself in the forehead. Right! Lavender shoes made those prints, only he wasn't in them. See, when I decided to borrow Mr. Jesse's boat... I borrowed lavender sandals, too. They're huge. That way, if Mr. Jesse saw my footprints, he'd think somebody else took his boat. Star blinked, startled. Hold on. Lavender is my brother, the race car driver, Dale said. What size shoe does he? Twelve, Mr. Rose said. Star stared at Dale, his face thoughtful. That would explain why the footprints are so shallow. You can't weigh more than, what, 70 pounds? 72, Dale muttered. Like I say, Dale's the second smallest in our class behind Salamander. He's sensitive. Dale and me been busy. He ain't had time to grow. The important thing is Dale didn't have no accomplice except a pair of sandals. And where are those sandals now? In the cafe by the drink machine, I told him. I'll need them. He studied Dell and looked friendlier now. Dell, I'd like for you to ride out, out of here in the back of my car. In fact, come here. Dell stepped forward, uncertain as Star produced a pair of handcuffs. 
Hold out your hands. Now I object, Miss Lana cried. We want an attorney, Miss Rose said, stepping in front of Dale. I'm not charging Dale with anything, Star said. If you let him ride out in handcuffs, I'll take them off of him as soon as we get to the cafe. Dale's no killer, I know that. But there's a chance the killer's watching this investigation, and if he thinks Dale's our suspect, he may get sloppy. Sexist, the killer could be a woman. It could be. In fact, it could be a woman in a bad wig, for all I know. Miss Lana's hand flew to her wig. Rose, it's a lot to ask, but it could really help. Miss Lana's hand flew to her wig. Rose, it's a lot to ask, but it could really help. I'd want people to think I've released Dale into your custody. Dale, I'd need you to let people see the handcuffs when we drive out. A setup? Excellent, I breathed. Rose, I'm not going to lie. We don't have many leads. If you'll agree to this, we'll watch Dale like he's our own until until this case is closed. And we'll hope Mr. Jesse's real killer makes a mistake, either because he thinks he's in the clear or because he doesn't like someone else taking credit for his work. Either way, mistakes will work in our favor. Dale looked at me, his blue eyes full of questions. If you're in, I'm in, I said. What? What would we have to do? Dale asked. Star gave him a quick smile. Do whatever it is you do when you're not conning cantankerous old men out of pocket change and interfering with my investigation. We'll do the rest. Star glanced at Miss Rose. My deputy is renting a room from Priscilla Retzel, and I'm staying in Greenville. Between us, we're here 24-7. What do you say? Miss Rose looked at Dale. Baby? Dale squared his shoulders. Don't call me baby, he said, and he held out his hands.